audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. History Makers with Matt Prater. Coming off of drugs, you're going to have emotional problems, but I kept chasing after God. And he's using this vehicle to bring people out of the dark into the light. And I went forward and I knelt at the front, and it, it was a radical conversion experience. And that's where the big change happened, and that's where we decided we're going to use our music for God, we're going to change our songs. When I was about 25 year old, I was uh, busted and into jail, and it was there that I came to the Lord. History Makers with Matt Prater. Prater. Hi, and welcome to History Makers. I'm Matt Prater. Today we're speaking with Reverend Ben Boland, who's a chaplain based in Stanthorpe in Queensland. How you doing, Ben? Doing well, Matt. How are you? Very good, mate. Let's find out a bit of your story. Where were you born and raised? Uh, born and raised in Tamworth, primarily. That was good. Did, did you have a religious upbringing at all? Yeah, no, my parents um, were both Christians, um, mm-hmm. and I had the privilege of really growing up in a Christian home and with Christian grandparents too. Ah. Um, so that was a great blessing. Um, I mean, we're, I think sometimes in the Christian world we celebrate people who have a, a rags to riches story for one of their phrase. Yeah. Um, whereas mine was much more um, boring than that, <laughs> but very blessed in that space too. Um, so yeah, that was significant. Um, I guess the big challenge for me was when you move out of home and you move to, okay, is that mum and dad's faith or is that my faith? And so I went and did a science degree up at Armadale at uni, um, and that was a very um, zoology space focus. So it had a very strong evolution focus. So it forced me to think through, does science disprove God? And clearly it doesn't. And then I actually came back and had failed some subjects and came back and worked in the abattoirs in Tamworth for a while. And while I was there, I had a mate... Um, who'd actually, his parents had both been mishos in the Middle East for basically all his life, and they came back for him to go to school into year 10, and he, he was in my year then. And he was fine, but about halfway through year 10, early year 11, he had an epileptic seizure, and which was fine other than he'd lost his licence, really. Um, after school, small country towns, everybody scatters to the four winds. He actually went to Bible college, but there was an incident with his medication and his medical issues. Um, and he came back bedridden, so I spent 18 months at home working at the abattoir and an awful lot of that time visiting him in ICU. And I buried him three, four years ago now. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that forced me really to think through the, the pain and suffering question too, which I think is a question um, any worldview, let alone any religion, is to face. And just, just backtracking a bit, so you, you had the religious upbringing. Was there a moment of conversion for you? Like, do you remember at a youth camp or an old school, or was it just a gradual walking with the Lord? Yeah, oh, I, I can't remember a time when I didn't believe in Jesus or didn't know Jesus. Mm, mm-hmm. um, um, yeah, for me, I don't know whether I just I wasn't paying attention or it was just so gradual, or I, I'm not sure. But yeah. yep. I'm privileged to know him and for him to know me, more importantly. Yeah, wonderful, mate. And tell us a bit about your ministry, uh, working as an aged care chaplain. What, what does that involve? Um, so I've been an aged care chaplain for 12 years now across mm-hmm. Sydney. Um, then up here, and I was still down in Melbourne during the COVID crisis to do that. So most of the, it's been involved in both independent living villages, so um, villages where you've got lots of little houses on site, and also in residential care and what used to be called nursing home. It's a little bit like a um, normal church or a normal parish, if that's the right phrase. What's peculiar is that my demographic, my parishioners are all either very old or staff. So I would normally run a weekly church service. Those things are normal um, in, a, in an, any church, really. Um, what's peculiar is um, some of the challenges we have. So I remember I was running communion in the nursing home at one stage, and we had four or five different types of wine or wine equivalents. So we had port wine for people who wanted an alcoholic option, (laughs) apple juice for those who didn't want an alcoholic option, and then three layers of different thickened fluids for people who couldn't swallow properly. Wow. Um, So it's just, it's the same, same, but with some contextual variants. Um, Lots of funerals. Uh, Yeah, for a while there I was doing a funeral every 10 days. Mm. Um, when I was doing the nursing home stuff, um, we were averaging three deaths a week. Wow. Uh, so lots of death, lots of grief, lots of sorrow, but also um, 
lots of conversion. In fact, the, the research says that as people age, um, they become more interested in spirituality. Um, and we have a great opportunity to share the gospel into that space. Now, when I say spirituality, I, in that sense, I mean spirituality in the broadest possible sweep of the term, meaning and purpose, as opposed to gospel. But there is a great opportunity, and I, I regularly see people come to faith, people living with dementia, people not living with dementia, and that's a wonderful privilege. And I guess you'd have the opportunity not just to minister to the residents, but also the family and the, the visitors as well. Uh, is that a big part of your, your focus? Yeah, um, family, visitors, staff, that is big. And again, particularly, well, one of the peculiar parts of my role is that unlike a normal person in a normal church um, or a normal reverend in a normal church, a bit of phrase, where most of the people they're going to be engaging with are Christians, most of the people I engage with are non-Christians. So it's a lovely opportunity and and ageing and suffering are not discriminating on the basis of race or gender or any of those things. So people who may have had bad experience at church or have never really engaged with church, sort of, oh, I couldn't go to church, God has struck me down with lightning brigade, come through my doors and I have the privilege of caring for them, loving them, um, and often sharing the gospel with them. Mm. Yeah, I often get that line that God had struck me down with lightning or the roof had caved in if I turn up at church. A lot of Aussies have that thinking and misunderstanding of God. How do you tackle that when, when someone raises that with you? It depends a bit on the context. It, it, my, fault, my default position is, look, mate, if God wanted to zap you, he could zap you here in the paddock. And just to try and emphasize that God is not limited to a church building. Um, now, I'd normally follow that up with a, Look, mate, you're a sinner like me. Yeah. You're broken. Um, I'm broken. Um, it's not about I'm too broken for God. It's about God loves me in spite of my incredible brokenness. And I'm curious to know about your journey into becoming an aged care chaplain. What did you do before that? How, how did you get the call into that area? My career path is somewhat complicated. Um, so science degree up at Armidale, um, then spent some time in the abbeys, then finished the degree got married and did an honours year, looking at flying fox reproduction, so bat sex. We looked at um, actually going into theology training at that point before the honours degree, prayed about it, didn't feel right, finished the honours degree, uh, moved into working into the electronics industry and then back into the meat industry for a bit. Then we had uh, our firstborn son and while the pregnancy was boring and normal, I didn't think it was normal, but my wife's a midwife so she ought to know. When James was born, um, he had significant health issues. So we had surgery at 12 hours, and that really pushed us. A, the church we're at really didn't provide spectacular pastoral care, and the chaplaincy we received was pretty abysmal too. Now, when James was about six months, I went, Beth went back to work and I did the stay-at-home dad thing. And while we're, I was doing that, we planted an extra service at church, um, and I had mentor one of the elders at church say oh, I really think you should be thinking about Bible college and we said oh look we've, we've thought about that and we've prayed about it and we we feel a real heart towards mission particularly uh, in probably Southeast Asia but uh, if you think we should go we'll, we'll apply so pray God if you want us to get in make sure we get in if you don't want us to go make sure we don't get in um, I went for a year and didn't leave for three so ended up with the theology degree um, part way through that um, James's health was still pretty abysmal. Um, lots of hospital trips. Um, Beth resussed him three times in his first six months, so that was pretty scary. Um, and it became pretty apparent that we needed to be somewhere with some pretty substantial medical facilities, um, which wasn't going to suit Southeast Asia, really. And then sort of, oh, God, you called us into ministry. We think that's what we're doing. We've just invested two and a half, three years in this gig. What do you want us to do? So we looked at church ministry and we'd seen some people in church ministry who were struggling pretty hard and I wasn't sure whether that was the right space for me. Also knew that I was reasonably pastorally gifted. So in my third year I did a subject which was basically 200 hours of pastoral care. Mm -hmm. Theory was meant to be do 100 hours at the hospital to explore hospital chaplaincy and 100 hours in aged care. Or I applied for both and did my interviews for both. 
the hospital never got back to me. I had to sign a stat deck for aged care saying that I hadn't been involved in a fray in Bogabilla in 94, which I hadn't. Um, so it's okay. And I suspect that crashed the hospital system too. And they just decided that was too hard. But I did my 100 hours in aged care in Castle Hill in Sydney. And at the end of that, the team up there said, oh, would you like to do it as a student ministry job? And when you're at Bible College, the pennies are tight and experience is also important. And it was something I was really enjoying. Accepted that, so I did well over my 200 hours. And then at the end of that year, they offered me a full-time job. I've grown in passion and love for it since then. Um, people often ask me, do I enjoy it? And I don't enjoy it per se, but I'm incredibly passionate about it. Mm. Well, it's wonderful to hear that you've got such a heart to minister to the elderly, uh, and it's it's often not a big focus. A lot of churches focus on reaching youth and the next generation and the young families. Mm. But you know, there's a lot of a lot of people in aged care facilities that are really fearful, particularly during COVID. Have you seen how much that's changed uh, the uh, the direction of ministry? It has had an impact. Um, it's been it's been an interesting time right across the industry. Um, because on top of COVID, we've had the Royal Commission, which has made life challenging. And Ben's vote, and Ben speaks on Ben's behalf, not on anybody else's at this point, but is that we are incredibly underfunded as an industry. Mm. Um, and the expectations, while I've been in the industry for the last 12 years, have grown every year, and the funding has basically decreased every year. Um, and that makes it really tough um, in that space. It depends a little bit on who you are in aged care as to how affected COVID has been for you. So for people in Melbourne or in Sydney who might have been in serious lockdowns, or Brisbane for that matter too, that's very hard. Um, basically, right across Australia, everywhere has had some lockdowns in the aged care space, with the possible exception of Western Australia. But again, it depends on who that is. Some people have very, few, or many people have very few visitors to start with. And if you're not getting visitors and you've got a COVID lockdown, then it doesn't mean much because you still have no visitors. Yeah, It's often actually been the hardest for our our wellest residents who are used to being able to get out and have high mobility mm. and high visitor numbers because their world changed substantially. Yeah. Whereas for people who are significantly frailer and or don't have um, huge visitor numbers... It was almost a no change for them. Mm. I just remember from my youth group days uh, taking a, a youth group choir into the local nursing home and singing songs and you know doing Amazing Grace and how great they are and mm. they they just loved it. You know, it, you, you've really uh, stirred up some uh, memories for me there. It, it really is important that we do uh, minister to those in nursing homes, and you know, even if you don't know anyone, you could easily go in and you know start up a relationship as you know you could be a pen pal couldn't you you could you could be friends with with someone in a nursing oh, home minister to them there, there are there are there is no shortage of harvest here mm. if to push Jesus analogy mm. yeah look bringing kids in and doing youth group having combining your youth group with things i mean as you said before most churches these days have a youth group most churches Age care ministry is a second or third tier priority. Um, and, and there is so much we can do. Um, be a pen pal. Um, one of the challenges today is that we, we're so spread geographically. So my grandmother was in Tamworthville, um, whereas I'm up here in Stanthorpe. But, so I couldn't be in there visiting her as regularly as I would like. But simple things like making a short point of calling her most days on the mobile. My grandmother came from a time when there was no phone or the party line and phones cost an arm and leg. So most phone calls were three minutes because, oh, you better get off the phone because this will be costing you an arm and three legs. <laughs> but just making that phone call each day was really significant for her. So mm. that's a nice way. That's a simple way of doing. Yeah. Uh, going and visiting is huge. Um, I suspect both of us have probably done door knocking at some stage or another in our Christian world. And when I've done it a few times, and we basically had nobody talk to us, whereas there's almost nobody in aged care who doesn't want to be talked to. Mm, mm. Um, if you think you've got 24 hours in a day, let's say you sleep for 10, and we'll say you've got another five hours of things, what else do you do with the rest of that time? Yeah. Uh, incredible loneliness uh, and an incredible opportunity for us to just turn up and be with people and love them by being with them. Mm. 
Mm. It's a wonderful opportunity and a great reminder to anyone listening uh, to uh, you know connect with uh, their local aged care facility and maybe connect with the chaplain and say, hey, I'm from this local yep. church. What can we do? And uh, yep. you know maybe even run a chapel service at some stage. You, you, you do a lot of chapel yep. services as well? Yeah, um, we run a weekly church service, um, but we've had local church. One of the local ladies from our Baptist church was running a ladies' Bible study slash KYB group. Wonderful. For the ladies. I had one lady in Sydney who we used to run three a year of high teas. Um, fine bone china, female speaker, evangelistic, female musician. And we had 140 residents in the building, but we get close to 200 people for that. Now, there were lots of daughters, etc., so family as well. So what a wonderful opportunity mm. um, to reach, not simply to the older generation, mm. but to their loved ones as well. What a great ministry opportunity. Well, Ben, mm. it's been so good to hear of your role as an aged care chaplain and a bit of your testimony today. Mate, I reckon you're a history maker. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, man. If you'd like to hear this conversation again, listen online anytime at historymakersradio.com. You'll also find links to all of our social media channels and you can subscribe to our iTunes podcast. History Makers is a faith-based ministry and we want to thank everyone for their generous support. If you've got a suggestion of anyone we should interview, send us an email, info at historymakersradio.com. God bless. I'm Matt Prater and my challenge to you now is to go and make history. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.